let's give our children a hearty amen, amen. for the beautiful music ministry. It's always a pleasure to be in the house of God, Amen. to worship and fellowship with brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 11, anywhere we go in the world, we are to associate with God's people and worship him and fellowship. So it's always a joy. Even though it's my first time here, I feel like I know you. We've, we've known each other for a long time because that's the beauty of the Adventist family. I heard one of the visitors saying she's from the Brussels International Church. I had the privilege of worshiping there about six months ago. And it's one big Adventist family around the world. I would invite you to open your Bibles with me for our sermonic text, which is found in the book of Ruth. What book did I say, church? Ruth, chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at two passages from chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 and verses 19 to 22. Why don't we stand up out of respect for the Word of God this morning? And we can read alternatively. alternatively. I'll read one verse and you read the next. We'll do Ruth 1, chapter, verses 1 through 6 and then verses 19 to 22. When you have it, say amen. amen. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And Mahlon and Kilian died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Now we look at verses 19 to 22. So they went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Amen, amen. For the next few moments, I want to talk to you about looking for bread in all the wrong places. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was tempted to ask your pastor until what time I have. But I looked at the bulletin and it said, you leave at 1245. And then I remembered that I was preaching in Florida one time, and I asked the pastor, Pastor, how long can I preach for? He said, you can preach as long as you want, but at 12.30, we all go home. <laughs> and so I am not asking anybody. I'm just going to preach the word of God today. Is that all right? Yeah. Ruth chapter 1 is a very paradoxical chapter. It is paradoxical because it just at the beginning 
does not seem to make sense. For historical context, the author places it at the time of the judges. This is a very confusing time in Israel's history. You must remember that the patriarchs have long departed from the scene. It seems that a nation trying to forge its identity is now confused. It has lost its sense of direction. There is no longer a Moses to part the waters of the Red Sea. There is no longer a Joshua to tear down the walls of Jericho. Courageous and valiant men like Caleb seem like a far and distant memory. If you were there, you might have been tempted to ask, where are they, those powerful leaders of yesterday? Where are they, those giants of spiritual integrity? Where are they, those outstanding men of character? The preachers of righteousness, men whose mere presence inspired reverence and whose eloquent words elicited wisdom. Where are they? Leaders who could look you in the eye and say, thus says the Lord, without worrying about the political consequences. Unfortunately, they are no more. And in their place has arisen a mishmash of personalities and characters who refer to themselves as judges. Some of them are straight and upright, while others are downright corrupt. Some of them live life in the fear of the Lord, while others relish the life of whoremongers. Some of them dwell in enclaves of virtue, while others reside in, uh, in pockets of vice. Some of them look on the outside like unimpressive, ordinary, everyday folk. Yet, time reveals them to be men of integrity, while others look tall, dark, handsome, like Samson. Yet, over the course of time, they prove themselves to be spiritual weaklings. I believe that the, 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 the period of the judges can best be summarized by the last verse in the book of Judges. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own sight. So after 400 years of slavery, after 40 years of wilderness wanderings, God had brought his people to the promised land, a land supposedly flowing with milk and honey, a land where they could pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But something has gone terribly wrong. Verse 1 tells us that there is a famine in Bethlehem of Judah. This is problematic because Judah is supposed to mean land of praise. And when you look at the word Bethlehem, it is really a compound word. It is two Hebrew words put together. The first word is Beth or Beit. Beit is a Hebrew word meaning house. The second word is Lehem. Lehem means bread. Bethlehem is the breadbasket of Israel. Bethlehem is literally the house of bread. And if there is no bread in the house of bread, it means there can be no praise in the land of praise. And if there is no praise in the land of praise, it means that milk and honey no longer flow in the land of milk and honey. Something is wrong. And the question we ask ourselves naturally is, has God lied? Has God broken his promise? I'm here to tell you today that God does not lie. God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will never change. If there is a problem, it is not because God has moved away from his people. 
It is because God's people have moved away from God. Throughout the Bible, we find the thread of Scripture interwoven throughout the entire book. It is one in which God says, I will give you bread and you will give me praise. You will give me praise and I will give you bread. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, do you have your Bibles with you? Let me see them and raise them up. Let's give the devil a headache this morning when we read this word that confuses the devil. Deuteronomy chapter 11. The message that God gave his people through his servant Moses. We want Deuteronomy 11. And we want to see, beginning with verse 16, when you find it, say amen. amen. <clears throat> it says here, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived. And ye turn aside, have a little more volume, please, and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath will be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain in the land, and that the land yield not her fruit, lest ye perish quickly from the good land that the Lord gives you. In other words, God's saying to the people of Israel, be faithful to me, so that I don't close the heavens. And sometimes we read in Malachi, if we're faithful, then I will open up the heavens and pour out a blessing. Well, the same God who has the authority to open also has the authority to shut. And he's telling Israel, be faithful so that I do not shut heaven. Verse 26, behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I give you and command you this day, and the curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day and go after other gods. God is saying to Israel, the choice is yours. You can have a blessing or you can have a curse. You give me praise, I'll give you bread. And that is why when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray, he taught them, you will pray like this, our Father which art in heaven, allow it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it is only after we have praised God that we dare to venture to ask, give us this day our daily bread. So it's not that, that God has moved away from Israel, rather it's like a graffiti artist painted on the wall in New York City some time ago. He spray painted on the wall, if you feel far from God, guess who moved? It is not that God moves, it's that we move away from God. And so it looks like this famine in Bethlehem is the deliberate will of God. Things get so bad, the Bible tells us that a certain man says, since there is no bread in my house of bread, I'm going to have to go look for bread in other places. Since there is no Lechem in Bethlehem, let me go somewhere else. And the Bible tells us he takes his family and goes to Moab. This man's name was Elimelech. Again, powerful Hebrew name. Eli means my God. Melech means king. His name means God is my king or my God is king. And I believe that there was a national debate raging in Israel. 
Some people were saying, we need to be like all the other nations and have a king. And other people were saying, no, 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 we don't need a king. God is our king. We just need to be faithful to him. And I believe that when he was born, his mother and father wanted to let the world know which side of the battle they were on. And they called their son, God is my king. And every time that you called Elimelech's name, you were preaching a sermon. But Elimelech does not live up to his name. Because when the going gets tough, he decides he's going to pack it up and move and go to Moab. Why? Because there is no bread in the house of bread. He decides it's time to go. He went, the verse 1 tells us, to sojourn in Moab. The New International Version says he went for a while. In other words, Elimelech did not intend to stay in Moab. It is normal in the human condition that when things get bad and point A for people to seek refuge and point B. That's why we have migration and immigration. That's why a lot of you are here today looking for someplace better. The, the, the challenge is that once you move from point A to point B, you have no guarantee that you're going back. Like you, like these pathfinders, I grew up in an immigrant church. I was not born in the United States of America. My parents came to this country when we were young. And I remember growing up in my church and hearing the old folk talk. And the conversation went something like this. I don't know if you've heard these conversations. You know, I did not come here to stay. I came here to make a few dollars, and as soon as I assemble a few dollars, I'm going home. But a few years later, the conversation changed. It became, you know, the children are in school now. It would not be fair to them for us to uproot and take them home, so I'm going to wait till they finish school. And when they're done with school, we're going home. And then the children finished school. And the conversation became, well, you know, I'm, I'm only uh, a few years away from my pension. I, 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 I think I'm going to stay a little longer. And as soon as I get my pension and I can retire, we're all going back home. And then retirement came. And the conversation became, well, I am having a few health challenges. <laughs> my, my doctor is here. My insurance is here. I'm going to wait just a little more till my health stabilizes, and then we're going home. Needless to say that for many of them, the day to go home never came. I've been to their funerals, I even preached some of them. The point I'm trying to make is that when you go from point A to point B, you have no guarantee that you're coming back. Elimelech went to Moab, he had no intention of staying. But the Bible tells us that before he could come home to the house of bread, he died. How sad it is when God's children decide that there is no bread in the house of bread and they decide to go looking for bread in other places. Worst of all, when they think they can find it in Moab. You see, Moab is a nation conceived in sin. Moab is a nation shaped in iniquity. I don't know if you remember the story of Moab, how it started. It started with Lot in Genesis 19. After his wife got turned into a pillar of salt and he went to live in a little town with his two daughters. And after they're, they're, they're getting old, the daughters one day have a conversation. The older daughter tells the young sister, Sister, 
we got a problem here. Our biological clock is ticking. We are not getting any younger. There are no men here. And sooner or later, we're going to die without children. And so the younger sister asks, well, what do you suggest we do? And the older sister says, well, sister, here's what we're going to do. Tonight, when it's late, when it's time to go to bed, we're going to sleep, slip daddy a strong drink. And when he becomes drunk, I'm going to go lie with him. And tomorrow we can do it all over again and it will be your turn. And so they got their father drunk. I don't know if they gave him a strong rum from Kenya. <laughs> but they got him drunk. And nine months later, the older daughter has a son and she calls him Moab. And the younger daughter has a son and she calls him Benami. Moab becomes the father of this nation in the Bible called Moab. And throughout their history, Moab becomes a stumbling block to the children of Israel. I don't know if you remember the story in the Bible when the Moabites see God's people going through the desert. They've heard what God did to the Egyptians. So the king of Moab, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> The king of Moab hires a prophet to curse God's people. And when he opens his mouth to curse God's people, instead of curses come out blessings. Why? Because when God blesses you, nobody can take it away unless you give it away. If you want to see how God feels about Moab, turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 60, Psalm 60, this is God saying how he sees the different nations of the earth. Psalms verse 60, and we can look at verses uh, 6 through 8. This is God describing the different nations. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkah. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Verse 8. Moab is my washpot. God does not like Moab. If you didn't get it in the vernacular... Moab is my night pot, my latrine, my toilet. I don't know about you, but I would not want to find myself in God's toilet. God gave instructions for his children not to mingle with the Moabites. Every day, there are Christians like Elimelech who leave God's house of bread to look for bread in other places. How sad it is when God's children leave God's house of bread. God's bread of life can only be found in God's house of bread. Every day there are Christians who go looking for bread in other places. That, that, that sister that you haven't seen in church for a few weeks. Why? Because her unemployment benefits are about to run out. And she's been looking for a job for a while. But they called her and said, Ma'am, we have a job for you. You can come. But please understand, we, we, we don't understand your Sabbath thing. If you come work with us, you're going to have to work Saturdays. And she says to herself, I'll go for a little while. And then I'll have seniority and I'll be able to swap shifts. And start keeping the Sabbath again and, and start going back to KCC. If you go to Moab, you have no guarantee that you're coming back. The brother sitting in church today, who's maxed out all of his credit cards and owes a lot of people money. And every time the, the phone rings at home, you get a heart attack. 
and you ask yourself, how can I pay my bills? How can I take care of Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, and the utilities, and the light, and the everything else? And you say to yourself, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to withhold. No, 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 no. I'm not going to withhold. I'm going to borrow my time. And then when I catch up with all these bills, I'll go back to being faithful in church and do even more. If you go to Moab, my brother, you have no guarantee that you can come out. The devil is a cruel master. He knows how to rig your finances to keep you stuck. That deacon, that elder, and sometimes, yes, even that pastor who sits late at night by a computer screen when nobody's looking and decides to dabble in a little internet pornography. And you say to yourself, it's, it's only for a minute or two, but before you know it, you're stuck in an addiction. That pathfinder who decides to experiment, who wants to be part of the cool in crowd and takes that first puff of a cigarette, that first snort of crack, that first uh, experiment with drugs or liquor, and before you know it, you are trapped in Moab. My friends, don't go looking for bread in all the wrong places. And I've discovered that sometimes famine not only hits individuals, sometimes famine comes to church. And when famine hits the church, church can be a miserable place. When famine comes to church, members fight like cats and dogs. When famine comes to church, the church turns against the pastor, and the pastor calls the conference asking, when are you going to get me out of here? When famine comes to church, the nominating committee becomes the dominating committee, and they fight. I know it doesn't happen in this church, but you should see what happens in other churches where I've been. They fight like cats and dogs. When, when famine comes to church, uh, the building project, the fundraising project takes forever. When famine comes to church, you sow, but you can't reap. You try to evangelize and nobody comes. When famine comes to church, angelic pathfinders become juvenile delinquents. And the temptation is for us to say, since there is no bread in my house of bread, I will go looking for bread in other places. And so we go to the churches of Moab. We read their books and study their strategies and uh, even listen to the preachers of Moab and say, we're going to come here and preach the same messages after preaching a few words. Friends, God's bread of life can only be found in God's house of bread. If there's a famine in your church, God gives us the solution what to do when famine comes. Turn in your Bibles with me to the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, and looking at verse 13. Second Chronicles, chapter 7. This is the solution that God gives for famine. He says, if you have it, I hear some pages turn. I'll give you a second. Second Chronicles 13, 7 verse 13. God says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the lands, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal the land. The solution, my friends, is not to go to Moab. The solution is to seek God. Why? Because God hasn't moved. We move. And if we seek for God, eventually God shows up. Are you with me, church? God shows up. And so Naomi left with Elimelech. But the Bible, Ruth 1 tells us that Elimelech dies. But at least 
Naomi has her two sons, Mahlon and Kilian. But then the next verse tells us that both Mahlon and Kilian die because they were sickly. The name suggests that they were sick children. Maybe that's why daddy left to look for bread in other places. Naomi left Bethlehem with her husband. Now she's a widow. Naomi left Bethlehem with her two sons. Now they are no more. She weeps for them. And she's a forebearer of the mothers of Bethlehem who would weep when Herod would kill all the babies. Naomi now has no children. And in the middle of this, word begins to filter out of Bethlehem. I don't know how Naomi heard this, but verse 6 tells us that she, that, that she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Imagine yourself in this situation. You leave the house of bread because there is no bread. In the process, you lose your spouse. In the process, you lose your children. And now you hear there's bread in the house of bread. And what happened to these children is that when you go live in Moab and it becomes time for your children to get married and start a family, they marry what? Moabites. And so Mahlon and Kilian had married Moabite women. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. This is what God says about Moabites. I'm sorry. Uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 23. It's Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. Are you with me, church? Are you with me, church? An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. They shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. God did not want his children marrying Moabites. They were prohibited. Why? If you look, turn your pages to Numbers 25, God understood that when Israelites joined Moabites, Instead of the Israelites pulling up the Moabites, the Moabites pulled the children of God down. Numbers 25, verse 1. Here's a story of what happens. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods and Israel joined himself to Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. That day, thousands of Israelites died because they followed Moabites. But when you live in Moab, your children end up marrying Moabites. And I want to tell our beautiful pathfinders here, young people, when it comes time to start a family, your responsibility is to find other Christian Seventh-day Adventist young people and keep KCC alive by perpetuating the Seventh-day Adventist faith. The Bible says we are not to intermarry. What fellowship has, has a righteousness with unrighteousness or, or, or communion between darkness and truth, says the Apostle Paul. But Mahlan and Kilian married these women and they both died. And after Naomi is grieving and weeping, she hears, after losing her money, after losing everything she had, after losing her husband, after losing her sons, she hears that there is now bread in the house of bread. How the Lord had visited Bethlehem and given them bread. I don't know how she found out. Was it on the 6 o'clock news? 
Was it on Twitter or Facebook? Was it in the Bethlehem Post or the Moab Times? But she heard that God had visited his people and was giving them bread. Naomi decides it's time to go home. Now, the next, do me a favor. Look at the person sitting to your right. Look at the person sitting to your left. If they're sleeping, shake them up. Say, wake up and listen to the preacher. <laughs> well, I'm losing a few people here. Naomi decides that it's time to go home. And sometimes when we've been in Moab, we have to make the decision to come home. Let me say to you that coming home is not always easy. But there comes a time when God speaks to you and says, go home. It happened to the prodigal son when he was eating with pigs. He said, his senses, he came to himself. And he said, you know, I'm going to go back to my father's house. It happened with Jacob after Laban was cheating him and changed his wages ten times and robbed him of years of labor. And, and God called Jacob and said, Jacob! It's time for you to go home. And now it's happening to Naomi. Lost her husband, lost her sons, lost everything. And she learns there's bread in the house of bread. She decides that she's going to go home. Let me say to you that coming home sometimes is not easy. When the prodigal son went home, he found out that big brother was not happy to see him. When Jacob was heading home, he found out that Esau was waiting with 400 men to rip him apart. And when you come home, not everybody's going to be happy. Some people will remind you of your past, where you've been and what you've done. Some people don't want you to come back because you might park in their parking spot or sit in their pew or, heaven forbid, take their church office away from them. But it's not about them, it's about God. And Daddy wants you to come home. Amen. So just come home. Amen. Naomi decides she's coming home. And the next 10 verses of this story contain the part of that beautiful exchange between Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. You know the part where Ruth says, you know, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. That's not what I came to preach about today. Not about a Moabite who found grace in Israel. Most sermons you hear about Ruth 1 covers this part. So I'm not going there. But there's one thing I want to say about Ruth. Can, can I say one thing? I know we're running out of time. Can I say one thing about Ruth? When Naomi left Bethlehem, the space next to her was occupied by Elimelech. Naomi is now going back to Bethlehem, and the space that Elimelech used to occupy is now occupied by a heathen Moabite woman. You saw everything that God said about Moabites. Yet, in his infinite mercy, he accepts Ruth and adopts her into the family, grafts her into the vine. Ruth comes back and, and is adopted. And she has a son called Obed, who has a son named Jesse, who has a son named David. Thirteen generations down, all the way to Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And what I'm saying to you is that if you leave your spot, like Elimelech, you are a, a chosen generation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people... If you give it up, God might bring some Moabite, some heathen, and give them your spot in God's house. Don't go looking for bread in all the wrong places. The chapter ends with Naomi making her way back to Bethlehem. Verse 19 of Ruth chapter 1, she goes back. And as she enters the city, the Bible tells us, especially the modern version, that the women are gathered there looking at this broken woman 
coming back in tatters and rags. When she left, she had some wealth. Now she has nothing. And they begin to gossip. Is that really Naomi? Naomi, girl, is that you? I can see her co-workers, the choir members, her cousins, her neighbors. And I give Naomi credit because if it was me, I, I wouldn't have come back during daylight hours. I would be too embarrassed. Maybe I would wear a baseball cap and dark sunglasses. Is that you, Naomi? I would have said, no, no, I've been told I look like her. Bye, and disappear. <laughs> because you know how it is when you go home. You put on your best clothes. You shine your shoes. You put your best foot forward. You don't want the people to think it didn't work out for you in the United States of America. You don't want people to think you were a failure. Why? Because in this country, we love the successful immigrant story. You know the successful immigrant story. It goes something like this. That poor person, that poor Jew who almost died in the Nazi consecration camp, and he came to America, and today, because of his hard work, he owns skyscrapers in Manhattan. Or that Mexican who crossed the river with just the clothes on his back, but because he worked 18-hour days, or that immigrant who snuck here on the boat from another country, or how about this one, that, that medical student from Kenya who came here and got married and then started a family, and his son is the first black, black president of the United States of America. We love successful immigrant stories, but you and I know that not every immigrant story is a success story. Some have failed. The husband and wife who came, and they had a perfect marriage, but when they got here, materialism got them. And they started fighting over money, over issues. And that young person who was brought here too soon, and while their parents were working the 14 and 18 hour days, they started running with the wrong crowd. And, and that young person graduated in a life of crime and got a master's in prison and then got deported back home. Not every story is a success story. Too many migrants discovered too late in life that all that glitters is not gold. They went looking for bread in all the wrong places. And so Naomi comes back as a failed migrant. And she's honest. She tells the people, my life has become bitter. Don't call me sweetness. Don't call me Naomi. Call me bitterness. Call me Mara. But the beautiful thing about this story is that Naomi comes back. And the Bible tells us that at her return, it was time for the barley harvest. Verse 22. So Naomi returned. And Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her, returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. That's a paradoxical ending, a paradoxical beginning and a paradoxical ending. Why? Because the chapter begins with a famine, but it finishes with a harvest. And the question I have for you is, what part or what chapter in your life are you in today? Just because it may have started with a famine does not mean it ends with a famine. It can end with a harvest. I want to read one last Bible verse today. Can you turn with me in your Bibles to Joel chapter 2? Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 23. This is God speaking about what he will do through our famine. He says, verse 23, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause it to come down on you. 
the reign of the former reign and the latter reign. Verse 24, and the floors shall be full of wheat and fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore you to the years that the locusts have eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palm worm, my great army, which I sent. And ye shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. This is God's promise. Just because your chapter begin with a famine, it doesn't mean it will end with one. God is promising to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And this nation is going through hard financial times. There are people who have lost their jobs working a long time. There are people who saved up years to buy a house and make the monthly payments and it's all gone in a second. Wasted years. There, 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 there are young people who've gone to school who did the right thing and got their degree in college. Some went on and got their masters. But today, because of the economic situation, you can't find a good job. It feels like wasted year. There are wives who have worked for their uh, lives and who have been good wives and served their husbands only to be abandoned. It feels like wasted year. There are parents who have given it all for their children. You weren't perfect. None of us are. But you did more for your children than, they, than your parents ever did for you. And now they've grown. They've left you. They've abandoned you. They've forgotten you. It feels like wasted years. People who've invested in businesses and opened. And I ran my own business for several years. And I had to pay employees and rent and all the expenses. And I know what it's like. And you may have been forced to call bankruptcy. Or, or maybe you're one of these people who's been in this country for years. And your papers just can't seem to come through. Wasted years. Today God is saying to you, if you are faithful, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. You will have plenty to eat and you will give me praise. I will give you bread and you will give me praise. Just because some of you may be going through a hard time does not mean that God has abandoned you. God said there would never be fires or floods. He said, when they come, I will be with you. And so he promises us that he is with us and he can restore everything that's been lost in the blinking of an eye. Just don't go looking for bread in all the wrong places. God's bread of life can only be found in God's house of bread. So you will have ups and downs in your life. And perhaps the best story in the Bible that talks about these ups and downs are, is the life of Joseph. You see, Joseph went up to see his brothers and ended up down in the pits. He came up out of the pits and ended up down in Egypt. He came up in Potiphar's house and then went down into the prison. And from there, God raised him up to make him prime minister of Egypt. So you are going to have ups and downs in your life. And at times it will feel like there is no bread in your house of bread. But the Bible promises us today that if we are faithful to God, and I recognize that his bread of life can only be found in his house of bread. If we don't go to Moab and we remain faithful, ultimately God shows up. So be faithful. Be faithful in your devotional life. Be faithful in your prayer life. Be faithful with your Sabbath school lesson. Be faithful in your, uh, in your tithes and offerings. Be faithful to your God. Be faithful to your spouse. Be faithful to your parents. Just be faithful. And if you seek for God, he promises that when we look with it to him with all our hearts, he will come. Don't go looking for bread in all the wrong places. God's bread of life can only be found in God's house of bread. May God bless you today.